Walking through the forest with a team is both pleasantly nostalgic and exceptionally frustrating, considering that I have the benefit of good company but the downside of having to be led around by blind people. I used to take pride in how damn good a scout I was, back when I was a hunter. I suppose I didn't realize exactly how much I enjoyed being in charge, choosing routes, and deciding where to go. Elisa Veta does a passable job of it, but I find myself judging her the whole damn way. A couple times she leads us towards something small that feels dangerous to me, and I end up whispering a suggestion, which she follows. That always makes me feel smug. I wonder if it's similar to how I enjoy seeing my revenants follow my orders. At least I get a lot more practice doing melic things. The forest is as impossible to safely traverse as ever, but now that I can't just insta-murder everything in a wide radius without giving myself away, it's back to fighting dirty. By which I don't mean underhanded, I mean getting covered in mud, blood, and monster guts. It's making me really hungry. Lark too, though I suppose she's always hungry. This would probably go easier if you took your armor off, Lark, I comment idly bashing my shield into the side of a beefy beetle monster and activating a rune on the front to blast it off balance, letting Bentley take a nasty stab at its eye. I'd rather practice like this, Lark answers firmly, smashing the hilt of her sword into one of the insect's spindly legs to snap the joint. Well, if you're embarrassed about eating monsters, we could all take a few bites of whatever gets killed. You know, in solidarity. Something about that makes her pause, though I'm not sure what. No thank you, I'm fine, she answers. Damn. It was worth a shot, though. We keep hacking away at the monster the slow way, eventually bringing it down before once again moving on. I'm breathing hard, still frustrated at my body's weakness as I move my metal dust around, recreating the various metamancy runes on my weapons and armor that got expended over the course of the fight. I'd be down, Xavier says, huffing with even more exhaustion than I am to do the monster-eating thing, I mean. This guy isn't poisonous, right? I don't think so, Bentley answers, looking as refreshed as usual, the bastard. I think we tried cooking one once and it tasted awful, though. Wait, you did? Xavier asks. That's pretty great. Bentley shrugs. Penelope could make the meat safe, so Vita would always eat monster corpses instead of rations when we had the time for it, he explains. She wanted to save the rations for emergencies. Never seemed to mind the taste. W. Both Harvey and Lark briefly glance at me, which I interpret to probably be a bad sign. Come on, just because I suggested it as a joke? Dang it, I thought I'd been subtle enough. Jaleesa clears her throat, though, stealing everyone's attention. No monster cooking, we're in a hurry. Let's cut the chatter and move on. This way. And so we continue the journey both frustrating and long. My body needs to sleep every night, as I haven't even been storing or eating souls in fear it'll force me to hatch again. I royal at the idea of Lark serving as the overnight lookout rather than me almost as much as I've been frustrated with Jaleesa doing the pathfinding, but exhaustion doesn't let me lament it for long, most nights. About five days into the journey, though, I find myself struggling to sleep because I'm busy trying to design an anti-bug ward to keep the damn things away from me. Having to consciously ignore them while I'm awake is frustrating enough, but the number of bug corpses I find nearby after sleeping some nights is legitimately dangerous to my disguise. At least Lark either hasn't noticed or hasn't deemed it odd enough to press me on. Or so I've assumed, but now that we're the only two people awake she hesitantly turns to confront me about. Something. Her soul isn't the easiest to read. Hey. Melik? She whispers quietly. You tired at all? A little, I admit. Not enough to sleep yet, though. What's up? I guess you've... I dunno, she mutters, squirming a little as she looks away from me. I'm already out of my armor, since I'll hopefully be sleeping soon, but Lark hasn't taken hers off since we started the trip. Not even to pee, since she doesn't have to. Lucky duck. I've what? I prompt her. You've been... weirdly nice to me, she admits. You used to hate me and now you're just not being mean at all. You don't even glare at me anymore. I quirk an eyebrow. Do you want me to glare at you? I ask. Well, no, I just... I guess I'm just wondering, did something change? I note with annoyance that our conversation just woke Jaleesa, but she continues pretending to be asleep for now. I shrug, 
trying not to act as stressed out as I really am. I have no clue how Lark would react to the truth. All of us nearly died, I say instead. I think that changed the whole squad, honestly. I guess, she admits. Is that really all? I sigh. Well, here goes nothing. I can't think of a better time than now. No, I admit. That's not all. She tenses, leaning forward a bit. The truth is, I continue, I was partly a jerk because I find you really, really attractive. She stares at me. I stare back. Jaleesa tries very, very hard not to laugh. I don't understand how those two things relate, Lark eventually answers. Honestly, I don't either, I answer. Oh. Yeah. Another pause. So I don't. I don't want to have sex with you, Lark ventures. I wince at the horrid mental image that evokes. I very firmly do not want to have sex with you either, I agree. But, isn't that what attraction is? She asks. No. Well, kind of, I guess. But still no. Oh. Jaleesa unsuccessfully tries to disguise a choking laugh as a snore as Lark and I continue to stare awkwardly at each other. Do you think Vita could be one of us? Lark asks, changing the subject with all the subtlety of teeth to the throat. Fuck, what do I say to that? If she is, I hedge, she must be more interested in staying undercover than fighting us. Maybe she's making good on that alliance offer after all. What do you think would happen to her host, I guess? Jaleesa would be a better person to ask about that, I dismiss. She's an inquisitor. Of course, Lark answers. Of course. Okay, well, I guess she's obviously suspicious. May as well do my own super subtle inquiries. If she is hiding among us, I ask, what do you think we should do? Lark looks away, staring out into the darkness as if she saw something. There's nothing over there, though. I don't know, she answers eventually. I didn't know the right thing to do then, I don't know it now. At least killing Vrathitso is something I don't have to feel bad about. Every Vrathitso except one, anyway, I answer, grinning at her. She turns back to me, a complicated buzz of sensations once again spreading through her soul. Yeah, she allows. I guess I can keep one of them alive, since my squad seems to like her so much. I nod. Good. Now I should probably get to bed. Okay, she acknowledges. Malik? Yeah? There's another pause, one where she's clearly building up to say something big. Good night, is all that actually comes out of her mouth. Good night, Lark, I tell her, and curl up in my bedroll before fitfully passing into slumber. I dream of Penelope holding me, up until the moment when she turns to ash. Penny, I mumble, eyes fluttering open. Then my heart seizes with terror as I look around trying to make sure she didn't hear me call her that. She'd fucking kill me. Except. Oh, wait. I'm Melek, I'm here on a Templar mission, and I still don't know where my girlfriend is. I just have to hope Orville has good news for me when I get back. So I instead check if any of my squad mates heard my mutterings, and thankfully I seem to have woken up first, despite having gone to bed last. Convenient, but unlikely to last. I stretch my ill-fitting body and start the day, wondering when the she will inevitably drop. We all wake up in short order, packing up camp and setting off once again towards New Talsi. Or what's left of it. It's not long before Jaleesa gives the first danger call. We've got incoming. We do indeed. Vrathitso, I whisper. It's a Vrathitso, Jaleesa announces. Brace. Our shields go up, our swords are ready. Trained and drilled a thousand times. The shield wall we form now has already killed a dozen other monsters on the way here, a few of them Vrathitso. But to my surprise, the mindless charge of our foe starts to slow. Something in its soul starts to subtly shift, the mindless hunger changing to an altogether different instinct I don't quite understand. Something's abnormal, I whisper, and Jaleesa nods slightly, seeming thoughtful. Nothing we can do but keep our shields up and find out, though. Lark, Jaleesa says nonchalantly. You smell different, today. Um, is now really the time to complain about bathing? Lark asks incredulously. Nope, Jaleesa answers. The Vrathitsu emerges from the foliage ahead of us, not in a whirlwind of teeth and fury but hesitantly, as if confused. It is an odd beast, as all Vrathitsu tend to be, 
not much larger than a person, and almost simian-like with large, thick forelimbs that end in spiked, cudgel-like hooves. It has no head, instead simply a massive mouth splitting the area between its shoulders. Its hind legs are smaller, though wicked barbs on the calf lead me to believe they are no less deadly. And yet, it does not move to attack. I say it's confused, but I feel no thoughts from it, no greater intelligence that could be confused in the way a person would be. It is merely a bundle of instinct warring against a bundle of habits that, unexpectedly, no longer apply. A different stage in the monster's life suddenly calls to it, and it lacks the confidence born of repetition to act on it immediately. The hunger is quiet for a moment, and that stuns the beast enough that it needs a while to adapt. It plods slowly forward, its steps lagging until, finally, it stops. It sits down, hind legs spread. And something starts to expand between them. Is. Is that what I fucking think it is? Xavier asks, disbelieving. Yep, Harvey sighs. That's a penis. Why, though? Damn, Lark, you've gotten two propositions in two days, Jaleesa jokes. You're one popular lady. Lark doesn't respond, though, seeming to have not even heard. Lark? Jaleesa repeats. My Vrathitso squad mate's sword and shield clatter to the forest floor, a roiling mess of activity in her soul blocking out normal motor function. Best I can tell, she seems to be calculating, judging. And all the while, the monster in front of us waits. Lark. Jaleesa snaps in her giving an order voice. Talk to me, Lark. Report. That seems to catch on her consciousness a little, but the only response Lark has is a single word. Weak, she hisses. Her gauntlets creak as she flexes her fingers slowly, crouching low into a stance Malik knows well. It's one burned into his memory, after all, from moments before she shattered his ribs like I would a soul. Weak. She accuses, her voice full of wrath. And then she lunges. The other Vortizo doesn't react in time, but Lark's first blow doesn't kill him so the battle begins. Immediately, the rest of us jolt forward to assist her, but Jaleesa holds out a hand to stop us, and I can hardly blame her. The two beasts are a flurry of indiscriminate violence, Lark barely even seeming to realize her armor is on as she tries to claw and bite and scratch with chitin coverings in the way. Only when one of the feral Vrathitso's cudgel arm smashes open her helmet and shatters her jaw clean off does she start to properly fight back, ripping off her own gauntlets and digging her claws deep into the side of his body so she can scrape off and swallow meat with only her top row of teeth. She starts to regrow, and each blow the monster lands only frees more of her from the armor that holds her back. By the end of it, the monster dies with her on top of his corpse, all six limbs digging into his flesh. Back arched and quills out. She lets out a horrid, triumphant screech before her rage dies down, leaving her heavy breathed and horridly lucid. Lark, Jaleesa says calmly. You with us, girl? I, he. Lark stutters, slowly staggering up to her feet. He thought he could. He dared to. I realize, suddenly, that the cacophony now in her soul is a copy of what it was only moments ago. She has a perfect memory, I realize and that means these strange flashes in her soul are her reliving a past event. Lark. I shout loudly, startling everyone but most importantly her. She stares at me, giving me her full attention for a moment. Here and now, I tell her. She nods slowly, purposefully pulling herself out of her mental memory hole. I, I'm okay now, she says softly. I think. Can you talk me through it now, or do you need to take a break? Jaleesa asks. You're not in trouble, but we'll definitely have to report this. Yeah, Lark agrees. Yeah, I get it. I should be fine in a moment. She turns to the corpse, absent-mindedly grabbing it by the ankle and dragging it between a couple trees, which she proceeds to start flicking webbing at, crafting various traps for the monsters that will no doubt come sniffing out blood. With one of her arms she starts tearing off her mostly shattered armor, her silk clothing underneath stained black with blood. So. Lark says eventually. Sorry, everyone. I, that was different than it usually is, and it caught me off guard. Different how? Jalee suppresses. I wasn't hungry, Lark says, seeming awed by even speaking the words. I was more. Angry. Indignant. That he thought he was enough to. Too. She spares an awkward look back at the corpse. You know, she finishes. So, Jalee grunts. 
Vrafitso puberty? Vrafitso puberty, Lark confirms quietly. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it was probably that. Velp, Xavier declares, I don't know what I expected that to be like for you, but I probably should have expected the terrifying murder sex. That's not. We weren't. I know, I know, chill, Xavier answers, holding up her hands. That was just regular murder. Still, though. It's not murder, I correct. It's monster slaying. Yes, you're right, but can everyone please stop nitpicking my word choice when I'm trying to be funny? This isn't a laughing matter, Xavier, Jaleesa snaps. Lark, what do you think the odds are you'll lose control like this again? I, I don't know, she answers honestly. Less than this time, I think. I just, I wasn't prepared for it. I've never been angry like that before, but I don't think it's that different from a regular frenzy. Jaleesa glances slightly at me, and I give her a subtle shrug. I've never felt Lark in a hunger frenzy before, I can't really compare the two things. But the way her inner soul took precedence over her outer soul for a while is how I'd suspect it to work for her, after all. She's not frenzying so much as reverting to what every other Vrathitso does all the time. The Lark we know is the exception, not the default. Okay, Jaleesa nods. Well, we'll know soon enough, because I suspect there will be a lot more Vrathitso between here and New Talsi. You tell me the moment you feel any urges of a similar nature, okay Lark? Melek, you keep an eye on her too. I smirk a little under my helmet. Unfortunately, my most useful eye for the job is a bit blinded right now, but I can still make it work. Yes ma'am, I agree. The forest doesn't take long to prove Jaleesa right, but none of the Vrathitso that attack us between here and our destination are male. Probably because the male Vrathitso all died having sex, or failing to. I feel like Penelope would have a lot of complaints about this reproductive strategy. It feels like the kind of thing she'd go on a tirade about. It's a fun thought, and one that carries me all the way until we're a handful of miles from New Talsi and my soul sense starts peeking inside what's left of the city. The answer to which is, of course, not much. As expected from a Vrathitso attack, I barely even feel a soul in the city, and the few that I do are so small as to barely even matter. Of course I'm not feeling the entire city yet, so maybe as we get closer I'll sense. Melik? Someone asks but I barely even hear the words. Oh, shit. Holy shit. Melik. Is something the matter? Jaleesa asks. I realize, belatedly, that I've stopped marching. I shake my head and get back into formation. Sorry, just. Got distracted for a moment. What was the population of New Talsi, do you think? It was about 8,000, Lark answers. Why? 8 fucking thousand. No reason, I shrug as nonchalantly as possible. Just. It's a lot of people to lose. Yeah, Lark agrees. Yeah, it definitely is. Jaleesa doesn't stop giving me a suspicious stare, though, and I don't blame her. She should know, though, so I tell her. White, I whisper. What I judge to be an appropriate amount of terror grips her soul. Because, yeah, we might be fucked. The whites I fought, and made. During the Skyhope perception event at Soul Shard counts in the double digits. But if Vrathitso devoured everything here, that means they'd be leaving a lot of damaged souls behind. I don't know how all those souls ended up in the same corpse, but it feels like they did and that means, well, I've heard stories of whites that shatter islands. I'm going to have to be the one to save everyone, aren't I? Fuck. That never goes well. You might need to let me handle it, I whisper regretfully. I've thought about it a lot as we slowly approach, and so far as I can tell we have no better option. That white is packing the sort of power that could end civilizations if unleashed, which means the first and most important element is to not aggravate it. We need to be stealthy and we need to kill it instantly, before it can react. I have pretty decent stealth spells, and if I can lay my hands on it, I can rip its mess of assault to shreds. If things go badly, I can hatch and soul kill it with tentacles from a distance. The fused souls of an entire major city are of course far more powerful than I am, but the result is also fundamentally fragile. I should be able to break it apart faster than it can react, at least so long as I can reach it. Though that's kind of a heavy so long as I can reach it. What else can we do, though? Ignoring it would be leaving a walking perception event to wander around. Fighting it head-on is an impossibility, 
and bringing the squad only makes stealth harder without really helping the situation all that much. Jaleesa slows our march, focusing consciously on her own feelings. Kinda weird, but... Oh. She's sending me a message. Let's see. Confusion? A desire for more information? This thing is a dead city, I whisper to her, and it could kill one. Destroying it before it notices us is our only real option. Lark's ear twitches, and she sends me a strange glance. Or, oh, shit, I need to be quieter. Jaleesa, meanwhile, starts thinking about. Herm. It's a little more difficult to see without my eye uncovered, but my soul sense still does the job pretty well. She's thinking about me, I think. And death. I definitely might die, I admit quietly. But no one else even has a shot. Lark is fast enough but would take too long to kill it. Captain. Lark asks. Is there something wrong? We're slowing down. I hear screaming ahead, Jaleesa answers, and for all I know it's the truth. Ah, uh, shouldn't we be going faster then? Xavier asks. No, Jaleesa answers bluntly. It's too random, too. Discordant. I give heavy odds we're up against a white. Oh, shit, Xavier breathes. So what, do we just go home and grab a high Templar, then? No, Jaleesa says, shaking her head. I only hear the one. So if it's a white made out of the entirety of New Talsi, we can't afford to leave it alone. The island can't afford for us to leave it alone. It's an uncontrolled super weapon made of a city's worth of souls. The team pauses at that, letting the words sink in. What if it isn't uncontrolled? Harvey ventures. After all, we have an extremely powerful mass murdering Anamansa on the loose. This doesn't exactly feel like Vita's Mo, I protest, regretting it the moment it leaves my mouth. Come on, me, suspicious much? I meant ours, Harvey grunts. Gah, of course he did. Jaleesa sends me a questioning glance, to which I give a slight shake of my head. Come on, Jaleesa, I would have told you if I sensed motherfucking Ars Rainier around. It seems odd to leave the white in a dead city if it's enemy action, Jaleesa muses, but we can't rule it out. Either way, it needs to be destroyed. Our options for this are limited, in essence, the only safe way to kill a white is with full body annihilation before it even notices our presence. Does anyone have any ideas on how to accomplish that? Whites aren't traditionally the most observant of undead, but it will still attack living things on sight. She looks around, glancing between all of us before her gaze finally settles on me. Anyone? She repeats. Uck. I see what's going on, she needs me to give an excuse on why I'm being sent off alone, since it doesn't make sense for Melek to be given this mission. I'll just have to trust she goes along with any bullshit I think up. And I will say, one of the nice things about Melek is that his broad range of magical talents might actually let me get away with some bullshit. I think I can do it, I announce. Ultimately, killing this white is more important than my ability to stay undercover anyway. Explain, Jaleesa orders. I know enough kinomancy that I have a good shot at sneaking up on it, I claim. And with enough setup time, I'm confident I can destroy it in one shot. Rather than send me out to get it done like I expected, though, Jaleesa just looks to the rest of the squad. I'm a much better kind of answer than you are, Harvey insists. But I admit I'm not confident I can destroy it. My talent isn't great at that sort of thing. I'm not sure how I can help, Xavier admits. Me neither, Bentley says. But I don't like the idea of Melek going on his own. I should go with him, Lark says firmly. Or, oh, shit. No, that's the worst case scenario. You can't kill the white or cast stealth magic, I protest. I don't need to, Lark says. You can make both of us silent, right? I'll be your legs. I'll get us there far faster than you could get there alone, and I'll be there to bail you out if things go south. If I'm not there, and the white sees you, you're dead. Possibly actually dead since white-scale chaos magic might be able to damage my soul in a similar way to how Arden could. And even if it can't, there wouldn't be anything left of my body for me to possess if I got hit. Frustratingly, I can't deny that she has a point. I just don't want her to know I'm Vita, and this will definitely give the game away unless she's really, really gullible. Which she might be, actually. I guess we'll see, since I don't think I have a good enough reason to say no. I figure the odds of Lark killing me are less than the odds of the White doing the same. 
that might work, I agree, to Jaleesa's apparent surprise. I don't like the idea of the two of you going off on your own, she says firmly. I should also go. I'm not sure I could keep my balance while moving quickly and carrying both of you, Lark says hesitantly. I could try, but I might fall. And that might alert the white, I say. My spells can only do so much. Then it's fortunate that I can also cast them, Jaleesa grunts. Lark, what if you fashioned a harness out of your webbing? Can you do that? Lark raises her eyebrows, nodding thoughtfully. Yes, I could. That might work, actually. I could secure one of you to my back while I carry the other. But, um, I'd be a little worried about hurting you with my quills. You won't, Jaleesa says with confidence. I'll take the back harness. You can carry Melik. Get to work on it. Yes ma'am. She confirms, and silk starts to fly from her fingers, the weaving quick and precise. It's honestly almost hypnotizing to watch. So I guess the rest of us will sit here and... I dunno, pray? Xavier says glumly. Prayer wouldn't be unwelcome, Jaleesa admits. PFFT, speak for yourself. But yes, your primary duty now is to keep yourselves safe. If we fail, you have to return to Sky Hope to bring word. Gotta say, Captain, I've been less than impressed by my official missions as Templar so far, Xavier grumbles. Quit bitching and help me clear the perimeter, Harvey snaps. Bentley stays quiet as usual though he follows along to help Harvey as well, seeming melancholy. Or perhaps just resigned. Soon enough, Lark has her harness finished, which amusingly makes Jaleesa look like an oversized baby as she straps herself into it, Lark struggling to her feet with someone who weighs more than she does attached to her back. It's not an issue of strength, though, and when I get picked up into a princess carry in her arms she seems to be a lot better balanced. Ready? Jaleesa asks. Ready. Lark and I confirm, and we're off. Shit, she's fast. Even with all the added weight, Lark flies through the forest with ease, not needing guidance from Jaleesa or I to avoid the monsters in our path. I suppose this is as much her natural environment as it is mine, if not Moreso. But when we breach the edge of the forest and start dashing across the salt flats new Talsi is built on, and even when we reach the city, she seems just as at home. I guess that makes sense considering this was her home. I'm the one who chased her out of it. Where is the white, exactly? Lark asks, slowing down a bit to ensure our approach is careful and silent. A mile and a half afterward, I whisper. About a mile and a half afterward, Jaleesa repeats. Okay, why do you two keep doing that? Lark hisses. I can tell you're whispering to the captain, Melik. I can't make out most of the words, but I can tell you're doing it. Let's have this discussion after the threat in front of us is dealt with, Jaleesa answers diplomatically. For now, Lark, just consider it classified information. Yes ma'am, she agrees, though it's clear her suspicions have only deepened. I don't really have anything to say on the matter, though, so I stay silent. As we continue, however, something else interesting comes onto my radar, two people. Humans, as best I can tell, although one of their souls is so high up off the ground they can't possibly be. Wait. I look a little deeper into the pair of souls and find a rich, creamy center of infinitely ravenous void. These of Rafitso. Intelligent Rafitso. Fun. Well, they seem to be heading the same way we are, but they're far enough away that we should have plenty of time to deal with the white before they get here. Right? Damn it, I just felt one of them teleport. What kind of fucking monster did he eat that lets him teleport? I muttered to myself, causing Jaleesa to start to panic a little. Melik? She asks. Yeah, we've got incoming, I sigh, not bothering to be quiet about it. But we should still probably slow down, we're almost to the white. Lark nods, and Jaleesa and I get off the Vrathitso wagon express to sneak forwards with our own feet. A horrid wailing erupts ahead of us but thankfully it's just the normal sort of horrid wailing and not an indication that anything is going wrong. Okay, you two should probably wait here, I declare. Just be ready to scoop me up and book it if something happens. Also be ready to fight a teleporting, intelligent Vrathitso. Wait, what? Lark hisses. Stay silent, stay safe, goodbye. I answer back cheerfully. I make sure Jaleesa's silence bubble is fully active and covering Lark before I step away, taking my own silence bubble with me. 
I step carefully around the corner, spotting the white at the far end of the street, facing away from me and hugging its knees as it sobs and screams incoherently in the throes of madness. I creep forward, every lesson on stealth from my days as a thief and hunter coming to the fore. Failure here could have apocalyptic consequences. And I'd prefer not to go zero for two on solving that kind of problem. I creep closer, and all the while the teleporting Vrathitso is doing the same. The furthest distance I've felt him move in a single port is a bit under a thousand feet, and I've never felt him do it sooner than five seconds from the previous jump. A much weaker teleportation ability than Capita, then. But he's a Vrathitso, so it's probably not his only trick. Well, the important thing is that I get to the white and kill it. Picking up my pace as much as I dare, I creep up behind the white's back, the Vrathitso teleporting close enough that he probably has me in his sights. I'm close, so very close. But the moment the edge of my silence bubble brushes against the white, its twitching body jerks to face me, ruinous intentions coalescing in its soul. Too late, I hiss, and dig my gauntleted hands into its waist. With an outpouring of mana, I flood its body with my own essence, causing it to drink me in as it seeks to attack. It's thirstier than I can provide, quickly moving on from my offering towards Wachimana instead, the resulting detonation causing massive damage to its body. Enough to break apart huge chunks of its soul, though not enough to slay it. Yet I'm still holding on. I pull and tear, my power straining behind the restrictive wall of my shell, but still I start to break the white into its disparate shards, devouring it piece by piece. It screeches in pain and fury, but moments later it's dead and the fight is over. Dropping the corpse, I start stomping it into uselessness, ruining its ability to serve as a vessel as my own soul slowly starts to engorge itself on the shards of an entire city. Well, that was surprisingly successful. Amazingly successful, actually. I didn't expect to get such a clean win. Plus I no longer have to worry about the embarrassment of getting one-upped by an undead. I could hardly be a good queen of death if that happened. Mostly due to being scoured from existence by chaos magic. I seriously can't believe I pulled that off. I even got one of the best meals of my life out of it. Of course, I'm storing most of the shards inside my body rather than eating them all at once. I'm not that reckless, but I'm not going to give up on this unprecedented bounty either. I should be able to figure out if I can safely eat them all without hatching if I go slowly enough. And if not I can always ditch them before we get back to Skyhope and I run the risk of stumbling upon an Inquisitor that actually intends to prevent me from performing blasphemy. Now I just have one more annoying problem to deal with. Wow, a wry voice announces from a nearby rooftop, giving me a slow clap. And here I thought you'd be turned into vaguely human-shaped paste. Color me impressed. I deliberately turn towards the sound, spotting the striking image of a bipedal Vrathitso standing tall and flashing me a toothy smirk. His mostly humanoid head and torso give his silhouette a familiar shape, but the closer one inspects him, the less human he seems. It's quite an imposing mix of parts, honestly. Thick, puffy fur covers his shoulders like a regal coat, and six bone horns twist upwards out of the sides of his head like a crown. His whole body is long and thin the tips of his otherwise humanoid arms ending in foot-long fingers as sharp as blades. They look somewhat slick, as if dipped in liquid, and I decide to assume that they're poisoned. The most inhuman parts of his body are a long, segmented tail ending in a grasping claw, and the fact that each of his legs split into four insect-like spike-tipped limbs below the knee, though they're currently clumped together to imitate a more human shape. Actually, if I'd failed we'd probably both be dust, alongside what's left of the city. I answer him, seeing no reason to be rude. So I appreciate you not getting in my way, there. Thanks. He raises his eyebrows with apparent surprise. Well, I'll admit I didn't expect to be thanked by a human today. Kiro the Cunning, at your service. He dips into a lobo, and it's my turn to be surprised. A name and a cognomen, I note. Like a High Templar. You've had some run-ins then, I take it? I had to convince a rather dangerous aeromancer I was dead, he admits sheepishly. But I rather like the way she appended another word to her name. And I must say mine fits me quite wee. His words are cut off as I turn and sweep my hand behind me, reaching out to grab him. He dodges, barely, even though I catch him by surprise. I huff in irritation. This damn body is too slow. Whoa there. 
he exclaims, the illusion on the roof vanishing and appearing over Kiero's real body instead, where he had been trying to sneak up behind me. The real Kiero is still invisible, of course, and the illusion overlapping him slowly starts to deviate from his position as he walks away, raising his both hands in a full surrender. No need for that, he says soothingly. Sorry for startling you, friend. I wasn't intending anything malicious. Lie to me again, I warn him, and you'll regret it. Now what makes you think I'm lying, friend? He counters, but I see no reason to indulge the question. I turn and start walking away. Hey, hey. He continues. It's rude to turn your back on someone. It's ruder to eat them, I point out calmly. Which is what you were trying to do. The only reason you're still alive is because the things I would have to do in order to kill you would be annoying for me in the long term, so if you're really that cunning I suggest you teleport away while that still remains the case. His soul boils with anger as his body tenses. You arrogant fucking human, he growls, but at that moment Lark steps into view, Jaleesa hesitantly following her. The two Vrathitso stare at each other in abject surprise, an emotional explosion ping-ponging between them. Why you can talk? Lark manages to choke out. You're a Vrathitso and you can talk. Like me. PFFT, Kiero scoffs, flicking his claws dismissively. Talking is easy. Now, learning what all the words meant, that was the hard part. You're a person, Lark says, still hardly believing it. Like me. A pretty great one, if I do say so myself, Kiero agrees smugly. Kiero the cunning. A pleasure to meet you. He bows again. Or, well, his illusion does. His real body is now the one up on a rooftop. Tricky little bastard. Shame for him that none of it works on me. Lark, let's not forget that this is probably one of the so-called people that ate this whole city, Jaleesa reminds her quietly. I know, I know, she mutters back. But I don't want to kill people. Even bad people. Hey, I take offense to that. Kiero interjects. My love and I only killed maybe half this city, tops. I don't have any idea where the rest of it went. I was just dropping by to figure out what smelled so damn tasty and found this human already killing it. By the way, you have another one behind you. You gonna eat it? That seems to help Lark get over her apprehension. She bursts forward, claws grabbing for Kiro's throat. But of course they pass harmlessly through the illusion, which disperses into nothing. Immediately her eyes narrow and she starts sniffing the air, ears on a swivel as she searches for his real body. Whoa, whoa, I was just asking. Another illusion says, appearing behind her. You're human, you're territory. Got it. You sure are a weird one. The ground around Lark's feet shatters as she leaps up at the rooftop where Kira's real body is, crashing towards him faster than an arrow. But he teleports moments before they make contact causing her to massively overshoot and fall back to earth a block over. Hey, look at her go, Kiero muses, his illusion pretending to rest his elbow on top of my head. You humans friends with her, or something? I ate all of my human friends, you know. Go ahead and try to eat me, then, I tell him. Nah, Kiero says. I don't think we're friends. Shame. All I can really do is stand close enough to Jaleesa to prevent him from attacking her, then. This is kind of a frustrating stalemate. We need him to leave so we can safely meet up with the others. Xavier and Harvey's wide-reaching area talents are a much better matchup for someone this slippery. If we just start heading that way, however, we run the risk of Kiero noticing our allies before we can meet up with and defend them, at which point he'll outpace us with teleports and potentially kill the rest of the team before we can warn them. Hardly ideal. I could also just get him within 12 feet and then hatch, but again, annoying long-term consequences. Instead I decide to turn and stare at where I know his real body is, giving him a good glower behind my helmet. He moves, and I follow him with my gaze. He teleports, and I turn to face his new location. How are you doing that? He asks. I pull a gnashing shard up out of my soul, nestle it in the palm of my hand, and throw it at him. He dodges, seeming surprised and a lot more wary. And what the fuck was that? You're a weird-ass human. I'm starting to get a bit annoyed, I admit, at being called human all the time. And I'm starting to get a bit curious as to why, Kiro muses. Melek, Jaleesa mutters in my ear. I think she heard that one. 
she was going to find out sooner or later, I dismiss. And honestly, this makes things a bit easier. I tap the inside of the shell, making the tiniest little crack, so small as to barely even be noticeable. But from that and that alone, the scale of my true self becomes known to the world. The utter terror my presence evokes from anyone with the ability to sense it oozes outwards, the sheer difference in what we are becoming brutally obvious to the mouth of Thitso. Horror grips him, warring with that ever-present hunger that always wants to bite off more than it can chew. But Kiro, like Lark, has self-control. And he knows when he's outclassed. How about you fuck off? I suggest. I think I might, he concedes, and blinks away. I set about trying to repair the inside of my shell as Lark approaches us, dusting one of the thousands of shards floating inside my body and filling up the crack with it. She is, of course, horrified. Disgusted to the point of being sick. But as I'd expected, she is not surprised. So, she says softly. Is Melek even alive? No, I admit. She doesn't seem to have anything to say to that. Without another word, the three of us turn and start returning to the rest of the squad, Lark's thoughts on the matter seeming to mostly be in the form of memories. Neither Jaleesa nor I comment on her tears, 